Hello, welcome to Have A Go, and I'm Alan. Seeing as we're getting pretty close to the end of this project, I thought we'd do a little review and a recap. Yeah, look at how it started, how it's going, and any lessons I've learnt. So we'll start from the beginning, with the bed. Now Paul from Paul's Garage is right when he says that the bed is the worst casting. Because it's a big one, and it's right when you're first learning how hard to ram up your sand moulds. And also how tempered your sand should be if you're working with homemade stuff like I am. You'll learn a lot when you ram up this first casting being the bed. And I learned that while you can get someone to help you carry the mould outside, you can also carry it out in two parts. Carry out the bottom of the mould first, and then carry out, out the top half of the mould, which will also be a good test of whether the sand is rammed hard enough, because if it isn't, you'll get drop out, which is annoying, but at least you found out. Paul says not to do a simple pop gate in the top of it, and I found you can do a pop gate in the top of it, but you're going to get a little bit of problems around the gate itself. So if you're struggling for a crucible space like I was, then do a pop gate on top, rather than runners going down to the side like Paul did. Just bear in mind that you're going to have a defect around the pop gate, but there should be enough surface area from one end to the other that, yeah, it'll work out. As for scraping it flat, yeah, the top of the top of the bed. It's actually a pretty good lesson in scraping because it's it isn't recessed like with the slides on these things, so you're not having to try and get into a narrow yeah bottom of a groove yeah along the bottom of of that with the wall next to it. So it's nice and wide open, and you've got a long area to practice on and make your mistakes, and it'll end up covered by the ways. So if you do have a couple of gouges here and there. Nobody's going to know, so it's a good part for practicing. For the feet, again, you can just do a simple pot gate on top, except that it's even less of a problem with the feet if you get an inclusion, because you know, the top of the feet, you don't have to scrape it in or anything. I did a gate on the side of the feet because I had room in the crucible for the metal for it, dealer's choice. Moving on to the carriage, this is where this is class 102 in scraping because, like I said, now you've got to work yeah, in the corner of there, so you're having to work your scraper there without hitting the wall, so it's a lot fiddlier. Putting the ways for the cross slide on is your first real bit of precision re re relative to everything else at the start because it needs to overhang and it needs to have the screws so that they don't collide with the way screw with the leads screw for the cross slide going through here. If you get your screws wrong the lead screw can't go through then you're having trouble so this is your first bit of having to measure twice and cut once. Especially when you're drilling through here, you're through the tongue here, and then through the casting. If you're able to find a drill press with deep enough travel to drill that through hole, I highly recommend using your drill press because that will help you get a nice yeah, straight drill. One, not one that's going down at an angle or off to the side. Because if you go off to the side, you're going to hit the screws in the ways. If you go up or down, you're going to either hit the ways you're going up, or you're going to hit the casting going down. For the handles, Gingery says you can cast these handles on a steel mandrel and drive it out. My experience is that you can cast them on the steel mandrel, and if you try and drive them out, you're in for a lot of fun and teaching people around you some very naughty words. If you had a lathe, you could turn a taper on them, which would make it easy to drive them out. 
if you had a lathe. For the tool post, this is the first real bit of metal work you'll be doing. You know, with steel, not with Zamac, because you'll be drilling holes through here to make room for the tool to go through, and you'll also be filing the sides of the hole flat. Is where you will learn just how nice it is to work with Zamac instead of steel. Trade-off being that Zamac isn't as tough as steel is. The carriage is also where you will first learn the joys of shims. Shims going between the casting and the clamp that's holding the casting onto the ways. Like here's the white clamp here, here's the casting and there's shims in between it. With the shims making it so that there's exactly enough space to slide up and down on the ways. I did these, these were the first shims I ever did. And I honestly think I have to go back through them and re-shim it because I think that's part of where the flex I'm getting is coming from. There's not much. It's, it's sweet bugger all in terms of missing, but I think it's just enough that when the machine is turning, it's got enough torque that that little bit of shim wrongness is enough to make it... Yeah. So after that, the next part was the lead screw, lead screw, along with the lead screw journal bearings. This is the first, these bearings are the first part you'll cast on a steel mandrel to make a bore. I don't count these. I tried using India ink around it. On the basis that India ink has a lot of soot in it. Unfortunately it also has lacquer which seems to have off gassed in one of these things but I was able to fill that with whatever that metal epoxy stuff was and it's a low enough load and turns slowly enough it's not a problem but I tried it again later on and ran into issues I'll get into that in a bit once we've got the lead screw on, we can do the half nut. I'm not taking this off to show you, you know what's behind the apron here. The apron is one of the simplest castings. The half nut behind it is one of the worst castings. Because you'll be casting it on a length of steel threaded rod to form the threads in the half nut. And you will have the devil's own job of getting the threaded rod out of it. Lots of patience and a good Dremel tool is what I recommend. If I were to make the half nut again I would either put a couple of steel nuts on here with a steel strap across them, weld it up, take it off and then cut half of the nuts off or I would do two solid plates next to each other on the half nut base, thread a hole through both of them and then cut across the top and then dremel it off. I wouldn't do it as per the book except for casting the half nut on the steel mandrel. That works very well because the casting hangs on to the steel mandrel going through it like bilio. So Gingery's approach is both good and bad in that respect. After the lead screw and the half nut is the headstock. And for the temporary boring bar supports, I initially made them out of 2mm aluminium angle iron, but I remade them later on out of 6.35mm um, angle iron, not aluminium. And I'm very glad I did because I found that there's enough torque when this thing's turning that the 2mm angle iron would have probably have just deformed straight away, ripped itself to shreds and hilarity would have ensued, as the ancient texts say. As for the headstock itself, there's no real changes in terms of scraping in the wear pads, scraping in the top and the bearing caps, shimming and putting the clamps on. The only real wrinkle introduced with making the headstock is the sheer amount of metal that this thing takes. It takes so very much 
metal. It's as bad as the bed itself. For the counter shaft, well, it's pretty straightforward. Just cut things to cut the metal, drill holes and rivet. You just got to keep your wits about you with which way together things go. Otherwise, it's not bad. It's just annoying. You'll also have probably have to go through a few different V belts before you find the sizes of belt that's best for what you're making, since every one of these lathes is individual. As for boring out the headstock itself, I found that Gingery's approach of an unsupported boring bar yeah, going through it got a terrible bore, and I ended up having to do a line boring setup where the bar was supported at both ends with the borer in the middle. So it supported at both ends so the flex was greatly reduced. Which does mean that you need to make an extra boring bar support but if have already had practice making the first two. So don't do it as per the book for boring out the headstock. Once the headstock's made, Gingery has you make the tailstock first. I had better luck making the faceplate first. Because once you've got the face plate made, you can then strap castings to the front of it and face it off you know, with the carriage and the cross slide. So face it off and then once it's faced off, you can then scrape it in a lot quicker than if you'd sanded it, which inevitably introduces rounding. And the sanding also takes a lot longer. So I recommend making the face plate first and not the tail stock. Plus this is easier to make. As for the tail stock, the base of it is pretty straightforward. Nothing too amazing in terms of the casting, the clamps, the shims. The real wrinkle is in this locking bolt, which I don't know if you can see past the cross slide or not. This, the position of this doesn't actually get measured out in the book because Again, every one of these lathes is different. You're going to have to carefully measure it yourself so that the bolt doesn't collide with the ways. And then drill it according to where you measured. For the set over ways on top of this, he does give measurements and I highly recommend that you listen to those measurements so that the front face of this between the top and the bottom is flush-ish. For the top casting, I did not use a drill press for drilling the set over way adjustment screws and I recommend that you do because I did not get them straight. It's probably not a big deal and it upsets my OCD more than anything else but they are crooked for me which is annoying. They're centered vertically but horizontally they're up their skew. For the top casting itself using a jigsaw to cut the slot here works pretty well. Just bear in mind you are going to have to file the sides of it nice and flat and after you put the engine stud through the set over ways you know, to keep it clamped down you're going to have to file it again to make clearance for the engine stud so that the, the set over ways are flush against the tailstock here. As for boring this out I know people will scream at you about stick out, but you don't have much of a choice in this case because yeah, it's, the boring bar has to go all the way through this. And I didn't feel like buying another 16mm bearing and then machining down my, a whole length of rod stock going from here to here just for the boring bar. So I wound up using an unsupported boring bar to go all the way through this wasn't entirely bad though because I did get a reamer to ream through this to get exactly 20 millimeters from start to finish so I don't get any you know, curves from the boring bar deflexing because the reamer just reams it all out to the right diameter job done. So I highly recommend getting a 20 millimeter reamer or three quarters of an inferior or whatever system you're working in. And once you've got that made, when it comes time to make the ram for this, 
I also recommend getting a Morse taper one reamer because that means that rather than trying to adjust the set over of the boring bar support when you're machining out the taper with the boring bar you don't have to get that set over per perfectly aligned to go with the Morse taper just have to get it reasonably close and then the Morse taper reamer will get it for you you just have to be very careful to keep that reamer uh, aligned and parallel with the ram itself for the threaded rod I did not machine it like Gingri tells you to I started with a length of threaded rod and then sanded down the, th the threaded part that I didn't want yeah, the threaded part that I wanted to reduce to yeah, just a smooth shaft that did not work too well because when I tried to do it on the lathe it, it got very upset about the threaded nature of it which means the tool was going like this yeah, between the peaks and valleys and when I tried to do it on the belt sander to smooth, to smooth out the threaded part I'm pretty sure it bent it slightly which means that the hole in the end bell here is actually 7 millimeters instead of the 6 millimeters that the threaded rod the smooth section of the threaded rod is because the um, shaft is actually slightly deformed so as it spins it is deformed just enough that it needs that extra half mil radius I'm actually sorely tempted now that I've got this set up available to mount a section of rod between centers here and make another one and replace the threaded rod in there entirely we'll see whether I bother or not I still have to make the pulleys on on here which will for every revolution that the headstock spindle makes once I've got the pulleys in it'll automatically turn this lead screw 160 yeah, 16 times for every time that this turns so when the belts are connected I can put the half nut engaged and this will be autom automatically turning so as the spindle turns it will automatically travel down I haven't done that yet because I still have to locate the right size pulleys I also still have to make a permanent spindle for this so that's what I've got left to do as for what I've learnt I've learnt a lot about tapping holes and putting threads in them you use a lot of cutting fluid when you're tapping holes if you're tapping blind holes you've got to stop and tap out all the little shavings that the, that the tap creates as for drilling steel, like with the ram here, I've learnt that you start with a small bit, then you go to a slightly bigger bit, then you go to a slightly bigger bit again, and you work your way up to the drill size you want. If you just jump straight to, you know, from nothing to an 8.5mm hole like I tried with the first tailstock ram, you're in for a world of disappointment and a terrible job of it. As for fitment, of various parts I've learnt about the absolute need for precision and getting things right that you can't rush things because whenever I tried to rush like sanding down you know, wear pads on here or something like that with the belt sander I always came a cropper because it got rounded over or, so, or went far, too far down sanding or something else happened but all in all I've learnt a great deal of from this project and once I've got this buttoned up I think I'll move on to Gingri's Shaper project I won't tell you what that's about yet you can wait for when I start it but thank you for watching and have a nice day